ministry training, Luke 4.18, part 2. And uh, last week, if, if you have your Bible with me, you, you could turn to Luke chapter 4. And uh, this is where the Lord Jesus Christ walked into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. They handed him the scroll of the book of Isaiah. And he opened it and began to read where it was written about himself. And here's what is recorded in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus is saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable or the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and all the eyes of the people were upon him. And uh, they marveled at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. After he did that, he said, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, uh, this is the anointing that, that was resting upon the Lord Jesus Christ as he ministered on the earth for about three and a half years uh, prior to his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And so the same Holy Spirit that came and rested upon Jesus is now inside the believer. And um, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit is inside of us. We need to have the Holy Spirit power resting upon us. Uh, before Jesus went to the cross, he told his disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you, but he will be in you. Then after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and it says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they were born again. The Holy Spirit came to live in them. And then he told them, wait for the promise of the Father, for you've heard me say, you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit in power. You should be my witnesses. And they did. They waited, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. So, so before someone is born again, the Holy Spirit is with them, convicting them and wooing them to bring them to Christ. When a person receives Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in, they're born again. Being born again is an awesome thing. It's a new, it's a new creation. It's a miracle. But to serve God, we need the Holy Spirit resting upon us. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came and when uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized in the river Jordan. The Holy Spirit came visibly like a dove and rested upon him. And so we need that experience. We need uh, the Holy Spirit filling us and resting upon us to endue us with power to do the works of Jesus. And as we've uh, taught in the last couple of Sunday messages, the culmination of the age part 10, it's on YouTube, you can see it. That being filled with the Holy Spirit is an ongoing experience. It's a lifestyle of staying humble and hungry and uh, before the Lord, postured before the Lord, so that we can be filled continually. We need to be filled continually. Somebody say amen. amen. So everything that Jesus did, he didn't do until the Holy Spirit came in power and rested upon him. He went in the gospel of John, in the beginning of the gospel, he went to the wedding at Cana with the disciples and he turned water into wine. The Bible says this was the first miracle that he did. So there's no miracles that Jesus didn't do. He didn't do any before he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was resting upon him. So to do the works of Jesus, we need the same presence and power of the Holy Spirit resting upon us. Now Jesus told his disciples, in the Gospel of John, he said, As the Father sent me, I send you. When he uh, gathered his disciples after he'd risen from the dead, he gave them the Great Commission. It's recorded in Luke, in uh, Matthew, and in Mark, the Great Commission. It's to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and make disciples of all nations, of all ethnic groups. That's the word ethnos, of people of every tribe, every ethnic group, were to make disciples. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So what Jesus commanded the original, the first group of disciples was to go and heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, didn't he? He said, preach the gospel, freely receive, freely give. So that, was, that commission to, the, to his first group of disciples was then transferred to all disciples. 
Because he told those disciples, go and make disciples and teach them to do everything I commanded you to do. So now we're followers of Christ. We're commanded to heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, preach the gospel to the poor. Agreed? So Jesus uh, said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So we're sent. All the church is to preach all the gospel to all the world. So all believers should be involved in fulfilling the Great Commission, which is to take the gospel to the whole world. And um, so we want to be equipped to do our part. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he or she will also do the same works and even greater. So how can that be? Because the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that rested upon Jesus, the same Holy Spirit who did the works through Jesus is now with us. Amen. And so this is what we're talking about in our previous message, Equipping the Saints Ministry Training, Luke 418, part one. We talked about what Jesus said here. He said, the Spirit of God is on me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. We talked about that, preaching the gospel. What is the gospel message? And then he said, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And we talked about that. What is healing the brokenhearted? In a nutshell, to people have their heart or their soul broken by sin. Sins that we've done or sins that have been done against us. And sin causes damage. And so people are brokenhearted. And there's an anointing of the Holy Spirit to heal the brokenhearted. And in a nutshell, healing happens to our soul or our broken heart by one, receiving the love of God and giving the love of God. That's how we're healed. We believe in the love of God. We receive the love of God. But we also must be givers of the love of God. We have to forgive in order to have our own heart healed. We have to love in order for our own heart to be healed. So we talked about that. And there's a, a place uh, um, of healing of the broken heart where the presence, the impartation, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are involved to heal broken hearts. And I'll come uh, to that in more detail. But basically, for us to minister healing to the broken heart, it's the Holy Spirit will guide us, and oftentimes he'll use revelation knowledge and discernment from the Holy Spirit to help people identify the part of their life that's not believing God, not really trusting Him, not really relying on His Word, not really obeying His Word. And so not believing God's Word and not acting on God's Word causes our hearts to be unhealthy. So the anointing to heal is the anointing to come alongside someone, discern by the Holy Spirit what's ailing them, what, why is their heart broken, and help them. Basically, all, all of these things happen by repentance, helping the person to repent so that their heart can be healed. Repent from not believing God. Uh, repent from not forgiving somebody. Repent from yielding and focusing on fear instead of faith. All those things will cause the heart to be broken. Repent from uh, an, an inner vow or a bitter judgment. See, all of those things, an inner vow, a bitter judgment, an unforgiveness, focusing on fear, all of those are disobedience to the gospel. Because the gospel is a command to believe God. Believe God. Believe what? Believe that God's good. Believe he paid the price. Believe he loves me. Believe he's for me. Believe that when I confess my sin, he'll forgive me and cleanse me. Believe that I'm supposed to do what his word says, which is to love my neighbor and forgive and love my enemy. So that when we believe God's word and do it, our hearts get healed. So we talked about that. We talked about freedom for the captives. This is in the last message. And that has to do with Every kind of bondage that comes from sin. Jesus told the religious leaders of his day, he said, you're slaves because anybody who sins is a slave to sin. 
But he's whom the son makes free is free indeed. And so uh, we talked about freedom from sin bondage. And again, the, the root is always identifying the area where there's unbelief, not believing God's word, not applying God's word. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, he said, you should know the truth and the truth will make you free. So those are some of the things we looked at in the last message. Preaching the gospel, healing the brokenhearted, uh, uh, setting, bringing freedom to the captives. And then we finished last session on talking about physical healing. Now we're all called to do this. All of us need to be equipped to minister Praying and minister healing to people. Not just for the broken heart, but also for people's bodies. Somebody say amen. amen. So I'm going to try to recap a little bit of what we touched on as we finished the last message. And then add a little bit to the physical healing. And then we want to go on to deliverance of uh, getting people delivered from demons. That's a real need. And uh, then the uh, um, sight to the blind. We're going to try to talk about that. And then... Uh, the favorable year or the acceptable time of the Lord. So let's just recap some of the things we talked about. People need physical healing. People, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, healing. In fact, everything that is received by God, from God is received by faith. Okay? So healing is received by faith. When people touch the hem of his garment, he would turn and say, your faith has made you whole. And when we believe God, we can receive. So when we minister healing to someone, uh, and we're going to pray for someone for healing, our foundation for believing that God will heal the person is the word of God. And if we want to, and we should, we want to encourage and build up the person that we're ministering to by speaking the word of God to them. Because faith comes by hearing Romans 10, 17, and hearing the word of God. So we don't just pray and wish and hope. We pray with confidence. We know it's God's will. Because Jesus taught us in Mark chapter 11. That when you pray. Believe that you receive. And you'll have it. Didn't he say that? Now we can't believe that we receive. Unless we have a foundation of faith in God's word. If God said it in his word. And I know his word and his word's in my heart. Then I can believe it. Agreed? Okay. So there, here's some scriptures we covered. Psalm 103. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. Who heals all your diseases. That's the word of God. That's the heart of God right there. Now one verse is enough for me. God says he forgives all our sins and he heals all our diseases. That's good enough for me. But there's more. Isaiah 53 says, surely he bore our sicknesses. Now, depending on what Bible you have, it, it will say like King James, he bore our sorrows and griefs. But if you look them up in the Hebrew, you can, it's easy to do online now. Uh, it's a con concordance and lexicons. You can see the Hebrew word is literally sickness and pains. So he bore them. Isaiah 53, Jesus bore them. Now the word bore in Isaiah, in the beginning of chapter 53, when he says he bore our sicknesses, bore our diseases, which is often translated griefs and pains or sorrows, is the same word bore used in Hebrews 50, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53 verse 12 where it says, he bore our iniquity. Now the word bore means to lift off of, to bear, to lift off and carry away. So whatever Jesus did for our sins, he took our sins upon him and took them away from us. Agreed? So, so that same word, Isaiah 53, 12, he bore our iniquities. That same word bore is used of, he bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. So when he went to the cross, he carried our iniquities, our sicknesses, and our pains. Agreed? And he bore them. Now we know that was for physical healing because in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, it says, when evening was come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with his word, 
and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Then he quotes Isaiah 53, himself bore our, but now Matthew says, sicknesses carried our pain or diseases. So it's physical healing. It was provided for in the atonement. So when Jesus went to the cross to atone, he covered us body, soul, and spirit. And ultimately, when we have our full redemption, we're getting glorified bodies. Until then, Romans 8, 11, now here's another healing promise, says that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, who lives in you, will quicken, that's King James, means he will give life to your mortal body. Now that's enough for me right there. The Bible says, that's not talking about him giving life to my, the body that I'm going to get, my incorruptible, it's talking about this mortal body. He said, the spirit of Christ who lives in you will give life to your mortal body. Claim that. Believe that. Believe Psalm 103. He forgives all my sins. He does heal my diseases. Believe that how whatever he carried, whatever bore means for my iniquities, he did the same for my sicknesses. Why did he bear our iniquities? So we don't have to. Why did he bear our sicknesses? So we could be healed. Okay. So that's our foundation for healing. Now, healing is not always a cut and dry answer for every situation. People are going through things. But here's what Jesus said, as we want to summarize. He said, Whenever, whoever will say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it does not doubt in his heart. I'm reading from Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. But he believes the things that he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Now, this is Jesus. He's the master. He's teaching us how to pray. He says, whoever will say, be removed and be cast into the sea. It will not doubt, but believe that the things that he says will come to pass. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So Jesus is saying, first pray and believe. Believe when you pray that you receive. So if I'm going to pray for healing for someone, how can I believe that I receive? Because God's word says he forgives our sins and heals our diseases. So I, I can pray and I can believe. After I believed in my heart, I believe. Now I'm to speak to it. He said, say to the mountain and say and don't doubt. Now because suppose I pray for someone with a growth. I believe that Jesus bore their sicknesses, carried their pains. With his stripes, he's healed. So I pray, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, let your healing virtue flow right now into this person's body in the name of Jesus. Now I believe God heard me. I believe I receive. So if I believe, now I speak to it. He said, speak to the mountain. So now I speak growth. I speak to you. Go from this body. Tumor, disappear in Jesus' name. And he said, don't doubt, but believe. Because that's how we minister healing to people. Somebody agree with me? See, 2 Corinthians 4.13, the apostle writes, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. So faith has a voice. Now notice when Jesus ministered to people, he never prayed, oh, Father, please heal them. He just spoke. Receive your sight. Be healed. Now, I do believe that Jesus prayed and asked. For example, when he went to the tomb of Lazarus to raise Lazarus from the dead, he said, Father, I know that you all hear me already. I know you always hear me, but I'm saying this for their sake. So that means he had already prayed to the Father. And the Father probably told him, I want you to go raise Lazarus from the dead. So he had already settled it in prayer with the Father so he said, Father, I know you already hear me, but I'm saying this for their sake. So they'll believe. And then he said, Lazarus. So he didn't just say, oh, Father, please let Lazarus be raised from the dead. He spoke to Lazarus, come forth. So we pray and believe for the healing, and then we speak. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We have to exercise our faith, exercise our authority in the name of Jesus. We need to command diseases to stop. Command diseases to stop. Command sickness to go. Somebody agree with me. That's what Jesus said. Jesus talked to the fig tree. He said, no man will bear fruit from you again. 
He talked to the storm. Be muzzled. Be quiet. Be still. He, he stood over uh, Peter's mother-in-law. It says he rebuked the fever. So, so we're to follow his example. We believe that we receive, and then we speak it. Now, that's how we should do it. So before I wrote down a few notes, this is to equip you to minister. There's going to be people lined up, and you're going to have so many people to minister to. I'm telling you what kind of harvest is coming in. I've seen it. And so you need to know how to minister to people. Pray for them, believe, and then rebuke the sickness. Speak to it. But we also want to speak the word to the person that we're ministering to because we want to build their faith up. Okay? So before praying for the sick, speak the word of faith to them. That's what I always like to do before I pray for the sick. Quote the scripture to them. Tell the person, I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. I want you to know that Psalm 103 says that God will forgive all your sins and heal all your diseases because of what Christ did for you on the cross. Tell them that. Tell them Isaiah 53 says he bore your sicknesses, carried pains with his stripes, you're healed. Tell them Mark 16 says, because I'm a believer and Christ lives in me, that when I lay my hands on the sick, you're going to recover. In the name of Jesus, tell them that so faith uh, can come to them. So number one, before you pray for the sick, speak the word of God. Number two, make your request to God in prayer. Believe that you receive it. Number three, speak and command the healing. Number four, thank God. If you believe you receive, thank him. Now we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Jesus told people, go your way. And as they went, they were healed. See, when the 10 lepers came to him and asked him for healing, he didn't say, oh, Father, please make the leprosy go away. He said, go your way. Be healed. Right? Now, they didn't say, oh, our leprosy hasn't left yet. They obeyed. They said, okay. And as they went, they were healed. Remember, uh, who was it that came to Jesus, the centurion, and he had a daughter at home near death. He said, go your way, your daughter lives. It says that man believed the word. He believed it, and he said, okay, I believe it, and he went. When he got home, they said, they reported she's well, and he inquired, what time was it? It's the time that Jesus spoke the word. That's what the Bible says. So he went his way. He didn't say, well, how do I know? How do I know she'll be healed when I get home? Because I just said so. That's why. Jesus just said so. So, so if, if we believe, we act on it. See, that the ten lepers acted on it. They believed. They started going. They, their healing manifested as they walked it out. The father of the daughter, the centurion, he believed. When he got home, the miracle was there. So we hear God's word, we believe it, then we act on it. Then the healing manifests. Now, encourage the person when you minister to somebody healing, you speak the word to them, you pray with them believing in your heart, then you command healing. Then don't doubt. James says in James chapter uh, 1, he says, do not let the person that doubts expect to receive anything from the Lord. That person is like a wave tossed on the sea, unstable in all his ways. So don't doubt. How can you not doubt? You have to fill yourself with the word. Faith comes from hearing. It says, let him ask in faith, James chapter 1, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So don't doubt. Now, let's say now you're ministering healing to someone. You share the word of God with them. You, you pray and believe in your heart. You receive by faith. Jesus said, when you pray, believe, and you'll receive it. You'll have it. So by faith, you receive it. Then you speak and command the sickness to go. Now, you want to encourage the person to thank God by faith. 
You want to get the person to act in faith. Say, okay? Say, can you lift your hands and thank the Lord right now for healing you? Oftentimes, when, as soon as they do that, the power of God will fall on them. God responds to faith. So what we're doing, the anointing that's on us is to help people believe God's word and act on it and receive healing. Now, after you pray and minister to people, we're told in Hebrews chapter 6 that we receive the promises by faith and patience. So now, some healings are healings and some healings are miracles. Some are happen by process, some happen instant. Agreed? So when Jesus said they'll lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, he didn't say everyone's going to have an instantaneous miracle. He said they'll recover. Now that recovery is supernatural. So now when you pray for the sick and you believe you receive, maybe it'll take the person a week. Who knows how long the recovery is, but God said they'll recover, but it's supernatural recovery. Some people can be instant. Now what happens is everybody, a lot of people think if I don't have an instantaneous, feel some electricity in my body, that means I didn't receive. But that's not at all what the Bible teaches. Okay? There's, there's healings that are processed. There's miracles that are instantaneous. And there's miracles that are processed. Amen? So, encourage the person that we receive by faith and to be patient, to stay in faith and keep thanking God. That's, what we, that's how you receive. So I've received myself and I've helped other people receive. You stay in faith and you keep thanking God. Now I've used this analogy before, but probably not in the last message. If you were to take a healthy a fruit tree right here, healthy fruit tree right in front of you, and you take an ax to the very base of the tree and cut the tree down, how we know the tree is dead. But for the next two or three days, the leaves will still be green and there's still fruit on that tree. Agreed? So when you pray and believe and you rebuke a disease, it's dead in Jesus' name. But the leaves and fruit might still appear for a few days. It might take time for it to wither up. See, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, it didn't wither in front of their eyes. They left. They came back. 24 hours later, it was withered. Then they marveled. They said, Master, the, the tree you cursed, it's withered up. So we have to encourage people to receive by faith and to be patient and keep believing and not to doubt. So that's a good way to minister healing. So you can hear this uh, on YouTube or hear the CD over again. If you're not taking notes, and you can practice these. The Word of God is the faith foundation for our faith. We pray and believe. Then we speak. We rebuke the sickness. We speak the Word to the person. We build their faith up. We encourage them to believe. After you pray for them, get them to say, Thank you, Lord, I receive. Get them to try to do something. If you're praying for someone's arm, and then they couldn't move. After you pray and believe you receive and you rebuke sickness, ask them, stretch out your arm. Oftentimes when they take the action of stretching it out, the power of God will hit them. That's how Jesus did to the man with a withered hand. He said, stretch out your hand. So he asked the man to do something that he couldn't do. And when he did it, he was healed. So that's, that's part of working of miracles. The, one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit is working of miracles. And miracles have to be worked. In other words, there has to be an action. Jesus said, stretch out your hand. Name in the Syrian was told, dip in the water seven times. It was a working. You got to take an action. And then the miracle happens. Now there's another part of healing that we want to talk about. During the time that we're waiting for the healing to manifest, Let's say someone believes. Say, okay, I do believe. I, I see it in the word. You prayed for me. I believe I receive. Amen. And now maybe sometimes people wait for days or weeks for the healing to manifest. That's a good time to keep our heart toward the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything in me that needs to change? Or is there something you're dealing with in my life? Sickness is not always connected with sin. 
But sometimes it is. Sin means missing the mark out of God's will. Read Hebrews chapter 10. It says, uh, lift up the hands that hang down. Strengthen your knees, right? Make straight path for your feet. So that what is lame may not be, but it may be healed. So hands hanging down speaks of you let your prayer life go. You're, you're, you're not praising God. Lifting up holy hands is in the Old Testament has to do with incense, prayer to God. Knees that are weak is the same thing. Your prayer life, your devotional life is weak. Your knees are weak, your hands are hanging down. Make straight paths for your feet. That's integrity, walking in righteousness. So that what is lame may not be, but it will be healed. Now that's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. That's in context of every son or daughter the Lord loves. He chastens. So the Lord will allow things to happen to us if we're not walking like we should walk. If we're being sloppy, if we're being distracted, if our heart's being drawn away. I'm not saying God's making you sick, but he'll allow things to come. And uh, so during the time when we're praying, when we're believing, it's a good time to say, Lord, is, do I need to check the priorities in my life? The values in my heart? How's my walk with God? Come on, somebody. Now, this is where the gifts of the Spirit come in when we're ministering healing to people. And again, I'll, I'm going to save that. I'll talk to, that, to us about that later. But in James chapter 5, I want to read that. James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Um, it says, Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So he's not saying that sin is always the reason behind sickness. But sometimes it is. Agreed? Now, why does he say, let the elders anoint him with oil? Because oil is a sign that we're re-consecrating, we're dedicating our life wholly unto the Lord. Let me read from Exodus 40, verse 9. It says, you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. You shall hallow it and all its utensils, and it shall be holy. You shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and of all its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar must, uh, shall be most holy. You shall anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. That speaks of the washing of the water, the word. You should put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. So God would say the sanctuary, the utensils, the vessels, the priests have to be anointed with oil. And that anointing means they're consecrated and they're holy. Okay? Consecrated means I, a vessel in the sanctuary that was anointed with oil, was not allowed to be used for anything unholy. It was only allowed to be for holy purposes. So now we're to be a living sacrifice, holy unto the Lord. Agreed? So when he says, bring the sick, let them anoint him with oil, what it is, it's a rededication of that person. Now this is for the believer. See? He's writing this to the believer. Is there any sick among you, among the church? It's different for the unsaved. We can lay hands on the unsaved. They'd be healed. But for the believer, if he's sick, let him call for the elders. Let him anoint him with oil. That means let the person surrender their heart and consecrate themselves to live holy. That's what it means. So it means to get anointed with oil. It's not just a ritual. So some people can come up they're not checking their heart. They're not surrendering and saying, God, is there anything in me unholy? Am I loving my spouse? Am I living right? Am I, is my conscience clean? Is my imagination holy? Is my heart pure? See? So to get anointed with oil for healing means that you dedicate yourself to be holy unto the Lord. It says, then the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if there be any sins, they'll be forgiven. So that's the thing. Part of healing is uh, if there's a delay in the manifestation of our healing, 
is the time to seek the Lord and say, how are the priorities in my life? Am I living clean? Am I living holy? Is there anything in my life that's out of divine order? I want to get it right. So the gifts of the Spirit will help us to help people to discover the area that they need to change so that they can receive healing from God. Amen. Now, sometimes when you pray for people, um, we're not looking for sins. We're looking to the Lord. When I pray for people, especially when it's confidential and I'm praying for people, I'll ask questions. See, if I pray and I feel something, then there's a way to ask questions. Just ask the person to say, um, has the Holy Spirit been showing you anything in your heart that you need to make right with God? You can ask that. Sometimes I've prayed with people before and sometimes I'll get a feeling or a word like maybe it's unforgiveness or it's uh, gossip or uncleanness. So I'll ask the person, has God been dealing with you about this or this or this? And then they'll, off, they'll say yes. I said, okay, let's repent of it. Let's repent of it. And so when you help lead the person to repentance, then they can just receive, they receive the healing. John G. Lake had a powerful gift of healings and miracles. Now, the way John G. Lake ministered healing to people, he had uh, our documented, medically documented 20,000 miracle healings in a five-year period. I'm sorry, 100,000, 20,000 a year average. 100,000 medically documented healings up in Spokane, Washington in the early 1900s. He had a team of a dozen or so ministers that he trained in healing. Now, the way he, he ministered healing was he taught everybody the Word of God and built up their faith. For example, if someone came with cancer, he would interview him or his team of ministers. They would interview him and say, okay, before we lay hands on you or anoint you with oil and pray for you, we want you to come to the healing school every day to the, and with your Bible, and you need to come for 30 days. You need to hear the word for 30 days and be taught on healing, taught on how to live a holy life, how to walk with God. After 30 days, you get enough of the word in you, we're going we're gonna to pray for you. So that's how they ministered healing. He had a 90 plus percent of the people that came to their healing school were healed. So they, they put, they invested the word in them. Now the Bible says God sent his word and healed them. And then his wife had a very awesome gift of word of knowledge. He said the tough cases that we would take them through the healing school, we would know them, we'd pray for them. They still didn't get healed. We'd send them to my wife and she could get a lot of them healed because God would give her words of knowledge that would show them the sin in their life. It, and she'd show them very specifically. It's your attitude toward this person. It's this, you stole something and didn't repay it. She would have detailed words. And when they would repent of that sin, they would get healed. Isn't that awesome? So we need the, the word of God. And faith in the word is a foundation for healing. But the gifts of the Holy Spirit are very necessary. So anyway, that gives us a, just a very basic uh, Understanding how to minister healing. Got it? Okay. Now the next part of Luke 4.18, the anointing is not only to heal, but he said uh, to give sight to the blind. Now, I don't believe that this is just speaking about uh, physically blind people because that comes under healing. But I think that's a spiritually, spiritual blindness. Here's what Revelation 3.17 Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, because you say I'm rich and I become wealthy and I have need of nothing and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So they're blind. So there's an anointing on the believers to give sight to the blind. Help me somebody. How do we do that? The word, the word of God, the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 130. The entrance of your word gives light. Psalm 36, verse 9. In your light, we see. Let me put that together again. 
The entrance of the word gives light. In his light, we see. So the preaching, the proclamation of Jesus, the proclamation of the word of God gives sight to the blind. Yes, it does. Um, John 6, 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Hebrews 4, 12 says, The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the word of God is alive. Jesus said, The words I speak are spirit and life. My word brings light. In the light you can see. The word of God is alive. It divides between soul and spirit. It separates and it reveals the intents of the heart. So the word of God brings light. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 13 says, The word of God effectively works in us who believe. And so um, this is an anointing that's on us as believers as we minister Healing to the brokenhearted. Freedom to the captive. Uh, we're ministering the gospel to people. We're called to bring sight to the blind. And the way we do that is by sticking with the word of God. It's not our opinion. It's not a, we don't give our opinions. We don't, people don't need our theology uh, debate. They don't need our philosophy. Just the pure word of God. Speak the word. The Word has the power. The Word is alive. It's active. It penetrates into the heart. The entrance of the Word gives light. In His light, we see. So the anointed Word on your lips will give sight to the blind. So when you're ministering to people, you don't have to argue with people. Just speak the Word. Well, what about this? I don't believe that. What about that? Well, the Bible says, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. But this, you know, some people are hypocrites. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says the second death is the lake of fire. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we could become the righteousness of God. So we're not arguing we're just speaking the word. Well, I think this, I believe that. Well, the Bible says we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And God has made a way for us to be saved through Jesus Christ. Just say the word. That's the most important thing. Don't argue with people. Just say the Bible says, Jesus says. So that's... That's really simple. That's the anointing on us to give sight to the blind. Here's what um, Revelation 3, when Jesus talked to the church that was blind, the Laodicean church, he said, you're wretched, miserable, naked, poor, and blind. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed. The shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Now, he said you, we should buy those from him, gold and garments. But when it came to our eyes, we had to do it ourselves. He said, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So that means eat the word. The entrance of his word gives light. The Bible says, Jesus says, the word of God says. Uh, in Luke chapter 5, it says when Jesus sat down to teach the word, the power of the Lord was present to heal. So the power of God is in his word. For 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So he said, preach the word. Again, not our philosophies, not our opinions, not our debate. Just say what the word says. And there's power in that word. So there, we're just going down Luke 4, 18 and 19. So we talk about healing, setting captives free, sight to the blind. 
Uh, now we're going to talk about liberty to the oppressed. We still have time to cover this tonight. Are you ready? This speaks about, the oppressed speaks about demon oppression, demon torment, demon possession. So there's an anointing on every believer that Christ is in you, the Holy Spirit is in your life. There's an anointing on you to set captives free from oppression from demons. Agreed? He said, these signs in Mark 16 will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. How many believers here? That means you will cast out demons. Say, I will cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Here's Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. All right. Say, I have authority over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. All right. Now, how do we set people free? Again, it's leading people to repentance and faith in God's word. It's how they get free from oppression. And the Holy Spirit will guide us. He'll give us words of knowledge, words of wisdom. He'll help us. But basically, when... Um, it's helping the person to identify the area in their life where they've been in rebellion to God or disobedience. Help them to recognize it as sin, to repent of it, forsake it, and then have them speak the truth of God's word. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Here's what we have. There's, there's a five general areas of sin that open the door for demonic oppression. Oppression when the demon is tormenting you from the outside. And then they enter you and bind you and then they can possess people. Okay, a demon can't possess a Christian. But a demon can be attached to the outside of a Christian. Okay, there's a difference. You can't be demon possessed. The Holy Spirit is inside you. The devil can't be in there with the Holy Spirit. They can come and oppress your mind and they can do things if we allow them to. So number one, there's five areas of sin that need to be repented of and close the door to get the oppressed free. Number one, drug and alcohol abuse. Number two, sexual immorality, including pornography, homosexuality, transgenderism, bestiality, Sexual perversion. That opens the door for demons. Unclean, foul spirits will attach themselves. When people get addicted to pornography, it's not just an addiction. There's a demon involved driving the person. You need de deliverance. Number three, hatred, bitterness, judgments, and unforgiveness will give place to a demon. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Okay. Number four, witchcraft in the occult will give place to a demon. And number five, false religions. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Mormonism. You, you get demons. You get religious spirits, lying spirits. You get demons from false religions, idolatry. So those are five major areas. I'll say them again. Drug and alcohol abuse, sexual immorality and sexual perversion. Three, hatred, bitterness, judgment, all that. Number four, witchcraft and the occult. Number five, false religions. So to help the oppressed get free, let's say you just pray with someone. You lead someone to Christ and you know they have a background in, in doing drugs or sexual immorality. You want to lead them in prayer for deliverance. Okay? And, and it's simple. Whether it's, uh, whether you're leading, maybe you lead someone that's a Hindu to the Lord. If I lead a Hindu to the Lord, when, I'm, when I pray with them, I'll say, now, we're going to renounce Hinduism and every spirit connected with it. Because if they just pray, they receive, what happens is they've got hitchhikers. They're still attached to them. They have to really acknowledge this is idolatry. It's false religion. I repent of it. I renounce it. And I renounce every spirit connected. Then they get free. 
So this is why we're anointed to set people free. Let's say someone's had a, been addicted to drugs and alcohol. You can't just say, I'm turning over a new leaf. You need deliverance from an evil spirit. When you cross a line and you start abusing drugs and alcohol, you get a demon. I've seen them. I've dealt with them. You can give in, you can give in to self-pity and self-hatred and get a demon. You don't have to hate someone else. You can hate yourself and get a demon. So, suppose you're praying with someone and they've come out of one of these areas of sin, drugs, alcohol, sexual immorality, or sexual perversion, hatred, witchcraft, occult, or false religion. Number one, you help the person acknowledge that, what, that those five areas are a sin and must be renounced. So here, I want to come to Christ. Okay, we have to understand. Tell the person, you want to be free and walk with Christ. You're going to pray a prayer now to renounce alcohol and drug abuse or renounce pornography and sexual perversion. You're going to renounce it. So they, number one, agree. Number two, they have to acknowledge it's sin. Number two, they've got to be willing to turn away from it and confess it to God as a sin. Say someone comes from Hinduism or Buddhism or they're coming to Christ. They say, Lord, I confess this is the wrong way. I renounce that religion. I renounce that faith. I reject it in every spirit connected with it. So here's the prayer we lead. Here's how I lead people in prayer. For example, if someone's coming out of a, a sexual perversion or a false religion or witchcraft, they'd say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I confess, fill in the blank, as sin before you. And Lord, I renounce this sin and I reject every demon connected with it. Now, I've led people many times, as soon as I get to that prayer, I reject and renounce every evil spirit connected with this religion or this idol or this sin. The person, sometimes the demon will manifest and they'll get delivered right then. Okay? So you lead the person, acknowledge the sin, turn away from it, lead them in a prayer to reject and renounce it. And then have them speak out loud, Lord, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. I receive it. You have to say it out loud. And, then I, and I have the person to get delivered. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I, for example, I've prayed with people that um, have had tormenting spirit in a certain area. We pray we confess this, the area of sin. We renounce it. We reject the demon. Then I have them confess with their mouth. Like this is one of my favorite verses, Colossians 1.13. It says, God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Have the person say with their mouth because death and life are in the power of the tongue. I've watched people get free from demons the moment they say this. Let's say, Lord, thank you that you have delivered me from the powers of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of Jesus. As soon as they say it, the demonic power is broken. So this is how you lead this. I learned this the long, slow way. This is the way it works. You learn it the fast, easy way. Just listen to what I'm saying. Okay? Identify the sin. Help the person acknowledge. Say, hey, listen, you want to be free? You have to acknowledge that sin. And confess it to God as sin. Okay, they do it. Now say, Lord, I reject and I renounce every evil spirit connected with that sin. I turn my back on it. Then have them confess. Thank you that I'm free, Lord. You have delivered me from the powers of darkness. Have them confess it and they'll be free. Amen. I prayed with a person. Uh, I, don't, I think it was earlier this year. It was uh, demon tormented. Uh, pretty severely tormented. Couldn't even sit still. Just tormented. Had been for quite a while. And I wasn't able to get him free the first time I sat down. So I said, just give me some uh, time. I'm going to fast and pray for a few days. I need, uh, uh, I need the Lord to speak to me. 
So I did. And uh, what the Holy Spirit showed me was this person keeps saying with their mouth, the devil's always attacking me. The devil's always getting me. He's making me mad. The devil does this to me all the time. That was coming out their mouth all the time. But they wanted to be free, but they were always confessing bondage. The Holy Spirit said, that's why they can't get free. So I sat back down with him and said, okay, you ready? Yeah. I said, you want to be up free? Yes. I said, you have to repent of saying, the devil always gets me. The devil always beats me up. The devil always does this. Stop it. And start saying, Colossians 1.13. Jesus has delivered me from the powers of darkness and conveyed me into the kingdom of the son of his love. As soon as they said that, they were set free. So we have to lead the person to confess freedom. See, Christianity is a lifestyle of believing the word of God and saying it. That's what our whole walk with God is believing his word, believing it, walking in it, and saying it. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The word salvation, sozo, is a big broad word. It means forgiven, saved, blessed, healed, preserved. It means, it's a sozo is the Greek word. It means our complete salvation. So he says, he's not saying if you confess Jesus is Lord, that's not what it says. It says, if you confess the Lord Jesus. Now the word confess means say the same as, it's homologia. So God's, the way we experience our, all that Christ provided for us is we believe it. We believe Jesus is risen from the dead. We believe his word and we say it. That's how we, the confession brings us to the experience of the salvation. So if if someone believes that Jesus is their healer and they confess he's my healer, their, their confession will bring them unto the salvation of their body. If you say, Jesus is my good shepherd. He always guides me. He always shows me what to do. If you confess that, he'll show you what to do. If you, if you confess the Lord Jesus, he's my redeemer. He forgives my sins. He's a merciful God. Your confession is, un you'll experience that. But if you receive, pray to receive Jesus as your Savior, and you go, huh, nothing ever works for me. <laughs> Things are hard. <laughs> if that's how you talk, that's what you're going to have. Confession is made unto. Help me, somebody. Amen. So when you're leading people to freedom in Christ, you're leading them to believe and confess. I'm healed. Pornography has no more hold on me. Drugs have no more hold on me. I've renounced it. I renounce all the demons connected with it. He's brought me, Colossians 1, 20, 1 13. He's delivered me from the powers of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of the son of his love. When they believe it and confess it, that brings them into it. I'm almost done. But this is a, a nutshell class on deliverance. You're getting healing equipping, deliverance equipping. Amen. And you, everybody needs to do this. We need the whole body equipped. We need everybody. I'm not going to do it. There's no way. Even everybody here is not enough. We need hundreds of believers equipped. Hundreds for the harvest that's coming. We need everybody out there laying hands on the sick and leading people to Christ and helping cast demons out of them. Then the last thing he said, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the acceptable year of the Lord, meaning now, today is the day of salvation. Amen. So we're anointed to preach that the goodness of God, the blessings of the gospel are for today, right now with the person you're talking to. Not 10 years from now, right now. Today's the favorable day. Today's the day of salvation. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For today's the day of salvation. That's the anointing. Now, when Jesus walked into the temple, I'm going to uh, close with a couple of thoughts here. When he walked into the temple, it says in Luke chapter 4, as was his custom into the synagogue, 
They handed him the scroll of Isaiah. It says he found where it was written of him. He opened it up and found where it was written of him. Then he read it. He read the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me. He read uh, Luke 4, 18 and 19. Then after he read it, he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now that's what we should do as believers. And that's how we should lead people to believe God's word. When someone needs deliverance, we should say, look, at Colossians 1, 13 is for you. It says, he has delivered you from the powers of darkness. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid the price to deliver people from sin, from sickness, from demon oppression, from demon possession, from every bondage, from every addiction, he paid the price. He has, he did, past tense, deliver us. So now we're bringing the good news to the person. We can tell him, he has delivered you from the powers of darkness. He's brought you into the kingdom of the son of his dear love. So we say the word to the person. Get them to say it. See, Jesus found where it was written of him. He said it, and then he said, today it's fulfilled. So we find the promise of God. We say it with our mouth, and we say, today it's fulfilled. Amen. Today the scripture's fulfilled. Not I'm going to be healed, and maybe I'll be healed. No, I'm healed right now. But there's still pain in your body. That's not what I'm going by. The word of God says, I'm healed now. Today this scripture is fulfilled. That's how you receive. We receive by faith, not by sight. If you keep going by sight, if you wait for the physical symptoms to change and wait for that to happen until you believe, you'll be waiting forever. You have to believe first, then the symptoms go. That's how it is. So we have to tell people, to do what Jesus did. Find where it's written of you, and it's all in here. Here's where it's written of you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Say that every day and say, this scripture's fulfilled in me. That's what Jesus said. He read Isaiah and he said, this scripture's fulfilled today. We should say 2 Peter chapter 1. God has blessed me with every spiritual blessing. Not only in the heavenly place, Ephesians 1, 3, but he's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. Say, this scripture is fulfilled in my life. Say, Ephesians 2, 6, because of the blood of Jesus, what he did on the cross, and now I'm in Christ and Christ is in me, I'm seated with him in the heavenly places. This scripture is fulfilled in my life. See, with confession brings you unto salvation. So when he said, today is the favorable year of the Lord, today's the day of salvation. It's not future, it's right now. And you may have heard me tell this. I've told it a few times over the years. In 1985, I was at John Osteen's church in Texas. And I was there to hear that. I heard the testimony with my own ears in the church that day of a woman who had come to church uh, prior to the day I was there. She was new coming to a Bible teaching church. Her her friend brought her to church. She heard John Osteen, who's the father of Joel Osteen, who planted that church. And, jo and that day she heard him, John Osteen was preaching from Luke 4, 18. And he preached what I just told you. He said, find where it's written in the scripture of you, say it like Jesus said it, and then say, this is fulfilled in me. He said, you can have whatever God promised in the Bible. So this lady had a a boy that was born. At the time, the boy was about one year old. He had a severe deformity when he was born. His brain was only the size of a walnut. And the rest of his head was just filled, he had a normal size head, just filled with water. So he's basically like a vegetable. And, and she said, she believed the word of God. And she told her friend that brought her to church, do you think we could find anything in the scripture that will meet the need of my son. This is before internet, before all the online stuff. Her friend said, I have a concordance at home. Let's go home and look through my concordance. We're going to look for a verse. They looked through it and they found a verse. Her friend said, I found a verse. It says right here, we have the mind of Christ. So because of what Christ has done for us, we have the mind of Christ. She said, I, 
I'm going to start speaking that over my son. So every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, she would say, Lord, your word says we have the mind of Christ. And I speak that this verse is fulfilled in my son, that my son has the mind of Christ. So she said that every day, God did a miracle and grew a brain in her son, made him completely normal and very intelligent. When I was there, they were giving the testimony of the miracle. He had He'd come out of first grade and got his report card in first grade, all straight A's. Before he was a vegetable. So, so confession is unto salvation. See, Christianity is a lifestyle of believing God's word in your heart and speaking it with your mouth. So when we help people to get free, we help them to believe God and to agree with his word and say it. The closing thoughts now. So there we just did a brief overview two Thursdays ago and today on Luke 4.18 and the anointings to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to set captives free, to give sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now is the day of salvation. I want to say two things that are very important as we minister to people, two very important things, and it's our heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart are the issues of life. Faith works by love. So we have to keep our heart in a place of love. And number two, God gives grace to the humble. So ministry is never about me. Ministry is never about you. Ministry is always about helping people. That means if, now if we're going to, if we want the grace of God when we minister, we have to be humble. Ministry is never about making me look good. It's about helping people. So that means if we're going to be humble, we become nameless and faceless. And if we have that attitude in our heart, God will give us grace. The one who gets glorified is Jesus. And number two, love has to be central to everything we do. When Jesus healed the sick, it says he was moved with compassion. So if we're going to minister, we have to have these two things in our heart. We have to pray always for God to fill us with his love. And then we always have to pray, Holy Spirit, help me to walk humble. Just give God all the glory. So if we walk humble before the Lord, and love is what's motivating us, will flow in the anointing of Luke 4, 18 and 19. And what will corrupt us is pride or lack of love. That makes us corrupt. So if we stay humble, full of love, that God will, God will put the love in our heart. God will put the compassion in our heart. And then, then we have the privilege and the blessing and the responsibility of helping people. That's what ministry is. It's helping people. I, I'll never forget, I heard T.L. Osborne. One of the greatest evangelists, I, in my opinion, T.L. Osborne, I was blessed to meet him. Just so full of Jesus, so full full of the love of God. And, and I heard T.L. Osborne preach on Luke 4.18 one time. And, and, and he, when he said this, what I'm about to tell you, it had such an impact because he lived it. His whole ministry was about helping people. If we want to help people, that's what love is. T.L. read Luke 4.18. He read the whole thing as a big conference. The Spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, you know, to let the oppressed go free, to give sight to the bride, and uh, set captives free, and, and all that. He said, you know what? He said, I don't know what all these words mean in the Greek. He said, but when I look at this, it means one thing to me. It means helping people. 
He said, the Spirit of God comes on our life. He said, the Spirit of God, he said, came on Jesus to preach, heal. He said, but sum it up. The Spirit of God comes in our life to help people. That's it. And if we want to really help people, God will anoint us. Amen. So that's part two.